My name is James Marshall and I am the CEO and founder of The Natural Lifestyles, which is an Australian-based natural seduction and lifestyle design company. And I'm a returning speaker two times to the 21 convention. My background is a pretty colourful and chequered career. Unlike a lot of seduction coaches, I didn't come from a position where I was, say, like a technical guy, a computer nerd or something, and then suddenly figured out some system in my basement and then went out and started picking up chicks, um, you know, in LA. Uh, my background was very diverse. I was a very nerdy, shy, and musically skilled kid. Um, I played the flute and, and studied opera singing at a young age, which was uh, not the coolest thing you could do in Australia at the time. And I paid for that dearly by being beaten up a lot, which led me to start studying martial arts at quite a young age. And I became very obsessed about uh, particularly Shaolin Kung Fu, or Kung Fu for you guys out there, Kung Fu. And this led me on a journey to actually travel to China, live in China, and eventually study in Shaolin Temple. So the background of my seduction abilities was actually forged uh, in the mountains of Hunan province when I was hitting rocks and meditating because I learnt presence, I learnt how to understand myself at a deep level, I learnt how to have command over my body and my intention and how to read the present moment. And there's a lot of talk about being in the now um, and awareness is kind of a, a new buzzword in the self-help industry. Uh, it's very important to develop, but it's important to understand that this doesn't just come from reading The Power of Now and, and thinking sometimes I should be more aware. It's actually a lifelong process of truly living in the moment. From that, your seduction skills skyrocket because a woman wants to be standing in front of a man who is truly present and with her because then you get to create a magical moment. I went from that into becoming a hedonistic musician as I pulled out my flute once again and then started playing wacky funk with it. Uh, spent years travelling around Australia as a broke musician, having a lot of fun. Um, became a massage therapist and uh, had a brief stint as a porn star in a feminist erotica movie, which is quite hilarious. And then eventually, more or less out of chance, started this, this business, which has then led me to travel to, I don't know, 35 countries around the world, having wild adventures, meeting very interesting men and women, and now spreading my message. The Natural Lifestyles coaches primarily men, although we have coached some girls, from around the world in strategies and principles on how to naturally engage with women without the need to have scripted lines or routines, and at the same time how to change themselves from a core level in terms of their belief systems, uh, their ideologies in terms of what it means to be a man in this modern world, and also strategies on how to develop a lifestyle that naturally draws towards you uh, passive social, sexual and financial income and creates a life that perhaps the Coen brothers would be happy to make a movie about. When I first started this company about six years ago, really it started as two guys who were broke, uh, didn't have any skills that they could make money out of. Uh, we were looking at a Latin dancer and a and a funk musician at the time. We started this company essentially to see if we could get paid to get laid. And we did. And we started to get really good results with the students. And over time as we matured as men and as people, we started to draw in a whole lot of other specialists in different areas. And what we saw was that in order to be really great with women, you need to be a man who works on all aspects of his life, not just going out there and picking up girls because then it's simply a performance skill. You turn on and off, it's something separate to you. And so for myself, I know over, my, over the last six years, I've gone through a massive evolution in conjunction with the company, and I think what I teach now expresses that, in that you need to be continually evolving and growing as a man and testing yourself internally and against the world if you want to move past stagnation points, if you want to remain young and vital and if you want to be attractive and to attract not just women, but all the great things that life has to offer. So I see the natural lifestyles as a vehicle for myself to evolve. And as I do that, everyone that is drawn in 
to meet me, either clients or you know, guys I work with, people that I do collaborations with, we start to infect each other with these amazing ideas and then cross-pollinate them. So in a way I learn just as much from my students as I do from um, you know, some of the other amazing coaches and the very challenging women that I meet throughout my life. So I see the natural lifestyles at the forefront of a new men's movement, um, which a lot of guys such as Anthony Johnson um, and some of the other very spectacular and uh, highly men with high integrity in this field are actually uh, at the vanguard of. Unlike a lot of the companies in the dating industry, we don't teach techniques per se, in the sense that we don't teach a scripted ABC method uh, to achieve results with women. Because in my opinion, seduction and dating is not linear. It's actually very flexible and spontaneous and should be so. So instead what we've done is we've backwards engineered the principles that men who are naturally gifted with women have. And I have nailed those down to five major principles. And these are the basis for everything that I teach. These are the ability for, first and foremost to have awareness, internal awareness to understand your own emotional state, your thinking processes, the way your physiology and your emotions and your thoughts interact, and then to have external awareness of what's going on around you in terms of the environment and most importantly, the girl that you're speaking with. Because it is actually the woman that will teach you how to seduce her through her um, responses to your advances. From there, we move on to the concept of intent, which is how you project and assert your own desires. Because a lot of men have a lot of shame, guilt, and fear about the fact that they are sexual beings, and therefore they actually censor themselves, which is a very unattractive thing to women when they're being approached, because the women can see immediately that they kind of want them, but they're scared to show that. From there, we move on to the other core principles. From this, uh, I've developed some very unique coaching programs that allow guys to have very concrete principles to play with. It's not like just go out there, be natural. It's, uh, we do certainly have a strategy and a step-by-step -step methodology, but at the same time, it's very flexible to the own personal, uh, the, own, the uh, person, the individual, and how they want to express that. So that experimental process that I and my coaches have been through over the last six years of coaching professionally, has led us to build some very unique coaching programs around the world, including the longest term uh, live-in residential, traveling residential in the world, which is the Euro Tour, uh, a 10-day, around-the-clock, madcap adventure through Central Europe with, in my opinion, the best natural seduction coaches in the world in a very small group, as well as other specialist programs such as understanding tantric sexuality, sensual massage, and many of the I guess broader and deeper philosophies behind becoming a very successful and long-term ladies' man. In terms of the success that we've had with uh, students and coaches on the tour, well for me it's been really good because I get to travel a lot and get paid and get laid, so that, that's nice. Um, but more importantly for the, uh, for the students on the road, of course, what we see is that guys certainly meet women along the way and have um, beautiful romances with them. But in a way, that's more of a side effect to the, to the uh, most important aspects, which is the fact that the Euro Tour is in itself a man's initiation. Because I think in today's Western societies, we tend to lack male initiation ceremonies. Whereas in a lot of traditional societies, when you are of a certain age, you were taken out to perform certain duties or certain, uh, you know, pass certain tests that would bring you into manhood. And because of the absence of, generally the absence of fathers and the you know, kind of explosion of the masculine feminine dynamic, a lot of men don't have that. And the Eurotour acts like that. We see guys going through a massive personal transformation whilst on this trip. Not only in the terms of the results with women, but in terms of asserting themselves as men, understanding themselves on a very deep level, knowing and facing their demons and their fears, and not smashing through them, but more like just piercing through them gently at one at a time um, to a point where they come to a place where they are at ease with themselves, which is, in my opinion, one of the most attractive attributes a man can have, to be okay with himself, even if he's not perfect. Only one or two generations ago, pretty much all boys were brought up in families where there was a man around, there was a father. 
whether he's a good father or a shit father, um, you know, there was a lot of variation on that. But there was pretty clear roles that men and women played. And I think most boys had um, pretty clear role models. And they were, it was pretty clear about what they had to do in life uh, in order to be a man in whatever society they existed in. Now, I think there are some advantages to that in the sense that, you know, you understood where your place was. Um, and also some disadvantages in the sense that there was only one place you were allowed to be. I come from a generation where a lot of guys were brought up without father figures and myself included. Not that I don't have a father, I do and I love him very dearly, but he wasn't really around when I was growing up. And as a result, I got to choose my father figures, which is something I'm very grateful for. I didn't have somebody telling me, listen son, this is how you got to be a man, this is what you got to do in life. Um, and so I got the opportunity to go out there and find my own influences. And I think for a lot of guys out there who are in that position, they might feel like they're missing out on something or that they were hard done by. And that can be true if that's what you believe. You can live that crutch all your life, that you didn't have a daddy around to tell you what to do, and so therefore you, you never became a man. But I would prefer that you take that as an amazing opportunity to go out there and choose your own life and choose your own mentors. My influences have been diverse and uh, in some ways contradictory. As a teenager, I was really into the doors. When's somebody gonna come up here and love me? And uh, nihilist French literature. And I thought there was no point to life and so we may as well just have a fucking good time. And then I swung from that into becoming quite a hardcore Buddhist. And so my influences were my initial Buddhist and Gung Fu teachers. And to this day, I have amazing respect for those men. Um, and they influence me every day in the sense that they taught me to take autonomy for myself, to not ex uh, accept anything without experiencing it myself, but at the same time to have the humility to be open-minded enough to experiment with a whole range of internal techniques or mindsets or lifestyle decisions. The women that I have had the privilege to have in my life as lovers or girlfriends have influenced me greatly. Um, I have a profound respect for women and they have taught me more about myself really than anyone else. Because a really good woman, when you meet her, uh, will act as a mirror to you. She will hold up to you your strengths and show you things about yourself that you didn't know existed. And at the same time, she will show you your flaws and your bullshit and reflect that back at you and go, what do you got for me? So the girls that I spent long periods of time with really shaped and influenced my life as well. And I think that's something important to understand. If you want to be a great seducer, you need to actually really love women. There are misogynists out there, there are players out there who fuck a lot of girls, but never learn much about women or about themselves as a result. And I pity those men because it's very, very short-term greedy goals. Um, I see seduction as a lifelong pursuit, something that both sexes benefit from and both grow from if done in, a, in, a, in an ethical and honest way. So, yeah, my influences, Jim Morrison, monks, chicks, and uh, of course the guys that I have come to uh, consider to be brothers and fellow warriors on this path that I've met through being a coach in this. I've met some absolutely amazing men, um, and I've also met some amazing charlatans and con artists who've you know, taught me about what I don't want to be and um, what can happen if you follow the dark side too long. As a, a mentor and a coach in this industry, uh, what I find is that in order for me to feel good about myself, I need to make sure that what I teach and what I do is in complete alignment. Now, I, I'm not saying that I have a monopoly on the truth, that I understand everything or I'm a master. And I think the moment you think that you must have mastered something, uh, it means you stop learning. So for myself, I'm constantly growing. I'm more than happy to receive feedback, criticism, and to engage with new ideas. But at the same time, when I'm coaching, I need to have conviction about what it is that I'm doing. And in this industry, as a, as a leader in this industry, uh, it holds me constantly accountable. And I think some people are okay with having a product or a service that they sell, which they don't believe in, or they know is bullshit, or um, you know, it's pure marketing, and then can live their own life and feel asleep at night. For myself, I'm not able to do that. And as a result, one of the best things about being in this industry is that I am constantly 
held up to my own standards. That I, if there's something that I expect somebody else to do, then I must be able to do it myself. I would never ask a student to do something that I have not done myself. And at the same time, I would never expect him to have a deep internal shift or to confront his demons or to face his ego or whatever else if I was unable to do it myself. Which is why I think it's good that I have been through a very wide spectrum of life experience. I have been a fuck up in some ways, at some points. Uh, you know, I have experimented with drugs. I have hurt women in the past. I have lied. I have cheated. I have done those things. At the same time, I have, um, you know, pushed myself to extremes of what I would say would be spiritual purity or um, living in complete alignment with my integrity. And because I understand the light and the dark, and I've been through those, and I've seen the consequences of living in both of those, I think I'm more than qualified to be able to coach guys from more or less any position they've gone through. Unfortunately, because this industry is completely unregulated, no government body has dared to come and look at, it, look at us yet, which is you know, good for tax, but not so good for regulating it. Um, there's, there's a lot of men who come to this because they are lonely because they are scared, because they are broken, because they are uh, missed out in life. They're vulnerable people often who come to, to be coached. And unfortunately that means that a lot of vultures circle around them and try and squeeze as much money out of them before discarding them as possible. And as a result of that, we're seeing a backlash where a lot of guys who've come into the community, received coaching, probably overpriced and overhyped and not really gotten any change out of it, have then thrown out the whole idea that you can be coached to become better with women or your lifestyle or to change your beliefs, which is really sad. When I got a guy come to me who spent 3K on a, a boot camp that he considered to be a ripoff, uh, the worst thing is not the money he lost, it's that because he was coached by the best in the world and it didn't work for him, it means to him that he can't be helped. And if a guy feels like there's nothing else for me, I can't be helped, that's, that's a really tragic thing. So I I think it's very important for myself and for the other coaches who I know have integrity and teach very well and get results that we actually start to call these people out and more, more importantly than that we band together and create uh, systems and standards that coaches must adhere to in order to be able to call themselves lifestyle coaches or seduction coaches. The question is where did the game go wrong or right? I don't think it necessarily went wrong. I think what it did is it, it appeared out of a particular city, Los Angeles, which is a bizarre place. It's not like most cities on the world, uh, on the planet. And it, it came out of a knee-jerk response to a bunch of guys who were nerdy guys who couldn't get laid with LA club chicks. And so they kind of modelled what was going on in the club and worked out well what, did, what were girls responding to and cobbled together uh, some techniques that would kind of mimic what a high value guy in that situation would be doing. Um, I think the game in itself is a really positive thing in the sense that it created a, um, you know, a public knowledge that this was possible, that it was possible to go up and talk to a girl across the street or across the bar without knowing her, without her being in your social circle and that you could have a shot at it. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Anything that gets a guy to walk across and talk to that girl is better than nothing. But at the same time, the presupposition that it was built on, or that all indirect schools are built on, is flawed. The presupposition is women won't like you for you. Therefore, you need to pretend to be something that is not you, and you need to trick them in order to get them into bed. All indirect schools are built on that presupposition, and it's, it's, it's a really terrible mindset to come from. So that brings us to the uh, debate, the question of indirect versus direct style of seduction. In my opinion, you should always be direct. And not just in terms of the opener that you use when speaking to a girl, but in terms of your life in general. A man must be able to assert himself, he must be able to put forward his desires, he must be able to go for what he wants without apology, without shame, um, and also without pride and arrogance. And the presuppositions behind the indirect styles of seduction is that you need to hide what you want in order to get it. And so essentially it is completely dishonest. And that's something that's very unattractive to a girl and it's something that when you've gone out there and tried to be indirect and a girl blows you out, you feel really awful. Because you know that in that moment you were not being true to yourself. 
you were hiding the fact that you wanted her and then she saw through that and of course discarded you. When I get blown out, which has happened three times, uh, by a woman after being clear and direct with her, I feel like a fucking hero. The reason being is that I know that in that moment, I went as far as I could. I did what I had to do and I reached an impasse that I couldn't get through because she didn't want me. And then I had to deal with that. And I walk away feeling bigger and better than before. Now, in terms of defining direct, a lot of guys think that that means you have to go up to every girl and say, hey, you're fucking sexy, I wanna have sex with you. Uh, that's stupid, that's, that's not calibrated at all. Directness first comes from your intention. It comes from your, what you're feeling in your gut, feeling in your cock, feeling emotionally, thinking, projecting through your eyes, and communicating to somebody. You can communicate so much through your eyes. So I don't need to go up to a girl and explicitly verbally state what I want to do to her with a bucket of bleach and a banana. Not that I would ever do anything with a bucket of bleach or a banana, but some people might. I can just go up to her and say, excuse me, I'd like to talk to you. And in essence, that is 100% direct because the implication is the only reason I'm there is because I like her. There are many levels of direct, and I think as a beginner, it's very good to verbalize it. To go out there and just tell a girl, look, you're fucking sexy, I really like you, I want to get to know you. Because so many guys have so much fear about the judgment they're going to receive if they let a girl know that they want her. And so it's great to just go out there and put it out there dozens, if not hundreds of times, and see that usually girls are very receptive to that. Even if they're taken or they're not interested, they will respect you for having the balls to come up and let them know that, yeah, they like you. And over time, as you get more subtle with this, more refined, a lot of that doesn't need to be stated. It can be implied through a look, through a touch, through, through verbal flirtation, which creates more sexual tension than overt statements of interest, and to the point where you can reach, you know, kind of Zen mastery seduction where it all pretty much happens in the ether, in space. I think one of the most important skills a man can have in life is the ability to see opportunities when they arise and take them where other people would be scared to. And I know for myself, the reason that I'm sitting on this park bench, which is very glamorous, uh, in Regent's Park in 2012, near the end of the world, is because I took a chance and invested everything that I had on a small opportunity I was given, I think four years ago to the day. At the time I was speaking at a very small dating conference in Sydney in Australia, and there was a guy there, a very larger than life character, called Vince Calvin, uh, who many of you would know. And Vince liked my speech and he invited me to come to the POA Summit in Hollywood. And at the time I couldn't afford to do that. Uh, you know, the business was in its infancy, we were really just getting by. And I took a big jump there. However, I had to, I made sure that I went to that conference. <coughs> and I made sure that I delivered a speech that was very unique and was something completely out of left field to what most of the guys had seen and heard before. And as a result of that, I met another young gentleman there by the name of Anthony Johnson. And I think to get what you want in life, you have to have this perfect blend of audacity and humility. Because men who are arrogant and try and force things in life, uh, tend to hit walls all the time. They tend to get judged, they tend to have to deal with a lot of conflict, and they surround themselves with sycophants. Whereas a man who is too humble and sits back and waits, uh, tends to have life pass him by. But you need to have a balance of these two things if you want to get what you want. You need to go for it and just go, yep, I want this. And maybe it's not my turn, but I, here I am at the front of the queue. At the same time, you need, need to have humility and to understand where the other person's coming from and not trying to push your agenda too hard. And so when I had a chat, it was a very casual chat with Anthony, you know, over 10 minutes, and we just, I think we just clicked on an, on an intention level, on an intention level, on a philosophical level, it was a casual chat, and I let him know, I would like to come and speak at your conference. And that was about it. So I think it was the next year or the year after, I found myself in London, in almost the same situation, where again, I couldn't really afford to be there. And I decided, it was a very rocky time in my life, I was separating from my long-term partner, uh, there was quite a lot of challenges going on in my life at that time. But again, I decided I need to fucking take this opportunity because you never know what's going to happen, who you're going to meet. And out of that, my reputation spread a lot. I met another guy called Sasha Daygame, 
who I've now been collaborating with for the last year and has highly influenced me and I think I've done the same to him and uh, now the sky's the limit. So I count the 21 convention the first time I spoke of that as one of those pivotal moments in my life where if I hadn't have just bitten the bullet and gone for what I wanted then maybe I'd still be just hanging out in Australia doing all right instead of conquering the world. In 2011, I first spoke at the 21 convention here in London, and that was a very challenging experience for me because although I'm, I'm very skilled at being able to uh, be calm and remain present, I was actually going through a pretty rough time. And if anyone can look at the video and pick it out, then um, you're doing well because I know how to look stoic and in control at all times, even when I'm not. Um, but that was a really fantastic experience for me because up until I remember trying to write that speech for quite a long time and I'm a good public speaker and I usually am very confident about what I'm going to do and up to the last minute before I stood on stage I really didn't know what I was going to say. Um, I had prepared some things but I just every time I went to go and practice this speech just nothing was coming out and I got up and I think I did a pretty good job and I think that's a testament to the fact that I have conditioned myself through a whole range of experiences to be not dependent on my state in order to be able to deliver what I need to deliver. And I think that's an important message for guys, particularly when they're looking at approaching girls or, or seduction. You're not always going to feel on top of the world. And confidence is not a static state. It's something that comes and goes depending on what's going on in your life or what experiences you're having, um, your mindsets and all those kinds of things. And confidence really comes from in those moments of challenge, in those moments of feeling weak, stepping out into the abyss and doing it anyway and seeing that it didn't destroy you. You know, the worst thing that could have happened to me in that moment is I would have got up and choked and some dudes on some forums would have laughed at me and life would have rolled on. And instead, you know, something good happened. So that, that time in my life was actually really pivotal. It was, it was me testing myself once again against the edge. And that's what I love to do in life. The moment I feel really comfortable, uh, like everything's cool, I'm in control, I just dis dismantle it and throw myself out into the deep end again, which is what I'm doing now, moving to uh, Budapest in two days. I don't know anybody there, I don't really know how it works, and that's awesome because that means I get to be tested once again. Um, so the experience at the 21 convention was, was fantastic. It was, it was really enlivening for me, it gave me a real shot in the arm and really kicked me back on my track so that when I hit the Euro Tour after that uh, and dragged along Steve Maeda and Sasha Daygame, we had the best tour we've ever had. I've spoken at a, a lot of dating conferences around the world, uh, which I have positive things to say about all of them. But what I've noticed about the 21 convention is that it tends to attract uh, the cream of the crop, the very best, in my opinion. You know, I might be wrong, maybe they're all liars, maybe I'm a liar, I don't know. But in my opinion, the best that the world has to offer. And I think that's obviously largely in part of the I think that is largely to do with the discerning judgment of Anthony Johnson because he's the guy at the end of the day who decides who's speaking. Uh, but also it's because guys who can't handle it, who are not good enough, uh, are, are not willing to stand up there and be exposed. There are other places where they can get up and waffle and um, you know, do convoluted sales pitches and use NLP, NLP tricks and it'll kind of pass, but here it won't because the other speakers know what they're looking at. Uh, game respects game and recognises his game. And it's a pretty horrible thing to be in a room full of people who know what they're doing and to be standing there pretending that you know what you're doing. So I think a lot of guys just uh, would not be willing to put their balls on the line to be exposed. So the convention attracts high quality because it demands high quality. And as a result, the attendees reflect this as well and I see this in my own business is the guys who come to me for training are awesome. They're guys I would be friends with. The guys who tend to have their shit together in other areas but for whatever reason have just not refined their social skills or maybe they have and they want more or they want better. And that's a fantastic thing to come to a convention where every guy that comes and asks me a question or that I speak to uh, is a legit person, is somebody who can look you in the eye, who can shake your hand, who's not trying to prove themselves or amog you or um, you know, cut holes in your theories just to validate themselves. They're people who are there willing and able to learn because they have already reached a certain point of their own personal evolution. And this is simply a reflection of what we're putting out there. 
Anthony came with pure ideals. I'm sure they will change and grow and evolve over the years, but his integrity has remained the same. He's attracted men to speak with integrity and attracted in attendees who want to live that, uh, live that truth as well. So having that experience where a young guy who maybe was feeling lost himself, maybe didn't have direction in life, and maybe thought that the, the jewels that life was promising were not his to have. And to see suddenly that he has that look where he, he knows that he can have it. He can go out there and be much bigger and much more than he thought he was, is a profound gift to, to receive as a teacher. Um, and knowing that from that, he's gonna go out there and live a kick-ass life is a fantastic thing because that's not just gonna affect him. That's going to affect the people around him, ultimately the woman he chooses to breed with, and therefore the uh, spawn that he sends out to the world. So seeing that coming from a shaky place at that time and knowing that even me at my weakest was still causing ripples in a good way really gave me a lot of inspiration to go out there, pick myself up and to, to for myself to, be, to again become more than I thought I could be. The other awesome thing was the connections that I made with some of the speakers. That year was quite profound in the sense that I connected with Anthony Johnson on a deeper level and I connected with Steve Maeda and Sasha Daygame and I then invited those guys to come and join me on the Euro Tour and out of that has come the most profound uh, and successful collaborations of my career to date because finally what I think we're seeing is the cream of the seduction industry starting to find each other and to be honest there are a lot of guys in this industry who should not be teaching um, not so much because they're ripping guys off, which they are, but mainly because if they're spreading information that is not correct or that is leading guys to put more masks on to be less of themselves, then they're causing long-term serious damage to the guys and therefore the girls they're going to meet. And I look forward to a time when the inner circle of guys who know what they're doing get together and create industry standards, which is not far away. Because you're seeing a lot of complaint uh, which is completely justified from a lot of guys who've been burnt along the way by fly-by-night con men. And we're coming to get you. Where do I see the 21 convention in five years time? Well, that depends on a number of things. Firstly, whether the world ends at the end of this year, which I really hope it doesn't because I'm starting to have a really great time and I'd like to have at least five more years to uh, complete my plans. Uh, this is also going to depend largely on Anthony Johnson in terms of his commitment, in terms of his ability to grow and evolve as a man because he's a guy who has got a lot of passion, a lot of willpower, who's very disciplined and well beyond his years in terms of what he's achieving. Um, but at the same time I think for this convention to continue to evolve and grow, and grow that's going to be led primarily by his growth and evolution and so I look forward to him taking the feedback, the, uh, the responses from the audiences, both online and live, and in terms of him internalizing the learnings that he's gathering through all the speakers that he, that he pulls together. Because as, his, as he grows, as his understanding of the world, of life, of women, of exercise, of you know, philosophy and all that stuff grows, so too will the convention grow. It will be limited by how much he's willing to, to grow. And I see in him pretty much unlimited potential for growth. So as long as he's evolving and I'm evolving and everyone else in the, the crew is evolving, I see it jumping from strength to strength over the years to come. I also see that seduction, the concept that men need to learn how to better themselves with women in life, uh, in exercise, in the way that their mindsets grow, is becoming a more mainstream accepted kind of idea. And as that becomes more accepted, so too will the ability for mainstream media and guys who are feeling a bit kind of shameful about it now to get involved. So I think as we uh, spearhead this men's movement, we'll see a lot of more guys will feel that it's not something to be ashamed of to come to a conference like this. It's something to be fucking proud of because most men are not satisfied with their lives and most of them make excuses and sit behind those excuses for decades. The guys who stand up and go, I'm not perfect and I'm not satisfied with life and I want more and therefore I'm going to come to something like this and with humility and audacity 
go out there and get what I want, are fucking heroes. So for anyone who's sitting at home considering, yeah, I would like to go to one of these events or I'd like to do coaching or, you know, I, I want to engage with this information, but I feel like that makes me a loser, please understand, it doesn't. It makes you a warrior on a path to personal growth, to, to actualization, to becoming what you could actually be. Let people criticize, let people naysay, let people whinge and whine. Um, that's their prerogative, that's their life, but don't let them drag you down. So come to places like this because these are think tanks of, progress, of progressive and positive thinkers. These are men who are skilled in their areas and are here not to make money off you. They're here to pass on information. They're here to pass on their wisdom because that gives them validation. Of course they get paid for it, but the reason that all of us as coaches are here is not for the money. It's not easy to be a dating coach or a health uh, expert or somebody who thinks outside the box and make a million bucks. It's quite difficult. But because we believe in what we do, because Anthony believes in what he does, we are here to deliver this and we'll continue to do it as long as men are willing to stand up and go, yes, I want to change. So the path that I took to get here today is uh, certainly not a linear one, certainly not a straight line, and I certainly didn't plan it this way. Um, what I did plan was to live life to its extreme uh, on multiple levels. I have been a, an extreme aesthetic in the terms that I was essentially a monk living in a mountain. And at the same time, well not at the same time, following that I became an extreme hedonist, uh, living purely for pleasure I guess. But the consistency there is that I do not want a pedestrian lifestyle. I do not want to, I, 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 it's not so much that I don't want to live in the box, I don't think I'm allowed in the box. I, I really don't think I should be there, it's not the place for me. Um, I see my role to exist throughout all sorts of systems, to be like lukewarm water, as they, they would say in Spinal Tap, um, to, to move through life and to gain pure experience, to try and master things that I apply my uh, mind and my will to, and to create influence, uh, not through you know, forcing anybody, but, but making people think, by exploding their realities, by questioning their presuppositions about what is and what is not possible or what you should and shouldn't do. Because I've done everything you shouldn't do really and I'm very successful in the sense that I love life, I have a great time, I get to travel, I get to do exactly what I want to do. And that's not because I was born in privilege. I was born in a very poor single parent household um, and had a you know, pretty rough childhood. I didn't have the backup to be where I am today but I refuse to have life crush me. And that's the, the message that I want to pass on to, to young men, is that no matter what background you come from, no matter what racial group or you know, religious background or anything like that, um, it's not about just positive thinking. You can't just think your way like, yeah, everything's gonna be great. You must face adversity. You must also face the fact that life has a lot of awful things that you're gonna to have to confront at some point. But if you do it in a way that is joyful and that is looking at the same time towards a great future and at the same time experiencing whatever you truly are um, involved in in the moment, then you don't waste any time. Then your life is a, a beautiful story while, rather than something that passed you by. So where this is going to lead me, um, I have no fucking idea, but I'm really excited about finding out. Uh, judging from where I came from six years ago to where I am today, um, you know, God knows, I could be running a small South American country, um, or I could be back in Shaolin Temple. Um, it's, it, let's, let's wait and find out, it's gonna be fun. If you would like to find me, good luck, because currently I live nowhere and everywhere. Um, if you would like to start to find me, the easiest way is to go to my website, which is thenaturallifestyles.com. If you're interested in joining me for one of my madcap adventures through Eastern Europe, you can go to theeurotour.com. Uh, there's a few places left on the last tour for this year. Who knows what's gonna happen next year. If the world ends, you're gonna really regret not coming this year. So come and check it out. My blog is thejamesmarshall.com. I'm pretty easy to find uh, online. And if you're really, really committed, come find me in Eastern Europe, you won't regret it.